Dear ladies and gentlemen, could I kindly ask you to please those who are interested in the launch take his seats and others who, who are attending other events uh, to, to leave, <laughs> please. We would like to start the, the launch of a very important program with our partners and ambassadors. So the moderator of the event today will be UNITAR, our leader in the leadership program, and uh, Mr. El Haddad will moderate the event tonight. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished colleagues and delegates and friends, uh, my name is Rabia Al Haddad. I'm the manager of the multilateral diplomacy program of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research that is headquartered here in Geneva. It is a pleasure to be here with you and an honor to be part of this distinguished panel that is um, with personalities with tremendous experience in multilateralism. Now, um, I can also assure you that the whole multilateral diplomacy team is thrilled and extremely happy for this event because we are launching the first activity of the Women Leadership Program through this event. And we have selected uh, the WMO Congress as a venue to launch it. First of all, because we have an excellent partnership with WMO and the, as a specialized agency of the United Nations. And second of all, we want to ride on the wave, the positive wave of energy that is here in Geneva and in this room. So thank you very much for hosting us. Now, a few words about uh, the, the program itself. So the program was developed hand in hand with UN Women, and uh, it is also uh, uh, with the support of uh, system agencies from the United Nations programs and funds. And the objective of the program is what? Is to support female delegates prior to multilateral conferences. So in our context here, it is before uh, the weather and climate change dimensions and contexts. However, we are discussing right now with other agencies of the United Nations to make sure that we provide such support prior to human rights conferences, trade conferences, and other conferences. Now, the vision is simple. It is in the first one pager that you might have in front of you. It's about promoting gender equality and leadership opportunities for women in Geneva's multilateral fora. And the objectives are two objectives. The first one is to bring agencies and other strategic partners to deliver capacity building for UN member states. And the second one is to deliver opportunities for women to build personal leadership skills. And these two objectives fall within the framework of UNITAR's mandate that aims at strengthening the intergovernmental machinery of the United Nations by empowering the delegates. Now, um, so the panel is a distinguished one, and I'm going to start by, uh, by presenting to you the persons from right to left. So on the extreme right, we have um, Ambassador John Quinn, who is a career diplomat from Australia, and he has been uh, representing his country since 1979. He has uh, occupied various postings in Tokyo, Manila, Nairobi, Honolulu, and other regions of the world, and he is also he was also in charge of many files related to political issues, military issues, and he is right now the permanent representative of his country in Geneva. Then we have Ambassador uh, Cecile Ribong, who is just next to him, who is currently chairing uh, the Geneva chapter of the Group of 77, and she represents, of course, Philippines. Uh, she was chief coordinator of the Office of the Secretary of Foreign Affairs from 2011 to 2013 in her country, the Philippines. And she was also, uh, from 2001 to 2003, presidential assistant on foreign affairs and chief of presidential protocol at the Office of the President of the Philippines. Then we have uh, Ms. Elena Manainkova. I think you already presented yourself before. If you allow me, I can say a few words. Yes, please. Thank you. So uh, she is, of course, the Assistant Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, and she has been in this post since 2010. Prior to this, she was Director of Cabinet of the Secretary General and 
External Relations Department. This was since 2006. And uh, she joined WMO since 2003 as Director of Atmospheric Research and Environment Department. She holds, unlike most of the delegates in Geneva who are coming from the humanities field, she holds a doctor's degree, PhD in physics and mathematics from the from Doctorate of Hydrometeorological Center of Russia, and this was in 1993. And then we have to my left side, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Paivi Kairamo, who is of course the permanent representative of Finland here in Geneva. Thank you for being with us. She served as, uh, since 2012 in this position, and she was previously the Secretary General and Chief of Cabinet of the President of the Republic of Finland from 2009 to 2012, and before which she held the post of Diplomatic Advisor and Member of the Cabinet of the President from 2005 to 2009. And she was also uh, the co-chair of the third UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in Sendai, and I think both her and Ambassador Ribong met in this conference and they were working together for a positive outcome to the negotiations. And then also to the left we have Sarah Sekenes, who is uh, our colleague from the United Nations Development Programme, and she now leads UNDP's policy work on efforts to achieve a sustained reduction in the impact and occurrence of armed violence and conflict with specific specialization on arms control and humanitarian disarmament efforts. Thank you for being with us. One thing I should add that is we are going to have three video messages at the end of the presentation of the panelists. The first one will be by Ms. Lakshmi Puri, who is Assistant Secretary General for Intergovernmental Support and Strategic Partnership at UN Women in New York. The second one is going to be from Ms. Margareta Wallström, who is the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction. And last, Ms. Amina Mohammed, who is the UN Secretary General's Special Advisor on the Post-2015 Development Planning. So we are going to have this at the end of the presentations. Now, when it comes to the uh, procedure of this uh, panel, it's going to be an exotic one. So we are going to have first uh, three questions addressed to our three distinguished ambassadors. And then after that, we are going to have the presentation, of course, uh, from uh, the two colleagues, from Elena and from UNDP. And then we are going to have the movies broadcasted. And, uh, and then we will open the floor. And we do hope that this will become a very interactive dialogue, questions and answers that will lead uh, to something extremely positive. And the last piece of excellent news is that at the end of this panel, we are going to have a drink together, all of us, in the main lobby in front of this conference room. So I will start first with uh, Ambassador Quinn. And your question, Excellency, is what actions can be taken to promote women's empowerment? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. El Haddad. Uh, and uh, uh, let me say how honored I am to be included in this panel um, and uh, to have this invitation extended to me with such a distinguished group of panelists. And let me say, with my colleagues from the Philippines and Finland and many other distinguished women in the UN system, I think what is most useful is to hear their stories because clearly that they, they're people who've prevailed against a number of challenges. So I'll be very interested to hear their views on how they've moved forward. And clearly, one critical element of this process is mentoring, where women who've achieved, who've prevailed, um, can actually advise us as to how they've done it and how others can, can move forward. Let me uh, congratulate uh, UNITAR and UN Women and the organisers for this initiative of launching the Women's Leadership Program. Um, this is, of course, a very big year for gender and for climate change. Um, we've got the Sustainable Development Goals negotiations, the Paris Conference later in the year, of course, we just had the Sendai uh, Disaster Risk reduction, meet, reduction Meeting where my Finnish colleague was a co-chair. So again, a, a wonderful illustration of women in leadership positions, the Beijing Plan of Action, um, and of course, the WMO Congress. And I think it's a really interesting juxtaposition of, of the issues because certainly one of the challenges, I guess, is women and science. And I was very struck to hear the Assistant Secretary General's accomplishments in physics 
uh, how we get more women and girls into the technical fields, and I guess meteorology is an area where we need more women as well. So I think this, this, this uh, juxtaposition is a very valuable um, uh, initiative. The, the symbolism is powerful. Uh, I've come to be cheered up today. I've just had a month in New York at the NPT Review Conference, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, which failed to agree on an outcomes document, um, not because of the very competent chairmanship of um, Ambassador Taos Faruqi from Algeria, another very senior woman who played a critical role, worked tirelessly to get a good result. So again, I think we've seen some wonderful illustrations of women in leadership positions quite recently. And as many of you would know, there's a challenge in, in the political and security realm to have more women in a more prominent role. So that's another field where I think women are underrepresented. Um, I think my job is to make a few um, observations about uh, gender and climate change, particularly uh, commenting on a, an initiative Australia is launching um, next month. Um, so I'll focus on those issues, but I might say a little bit also about other things we're doing in Australia in this field, but I'll be, be, be brief because not only am I outgunned by very senior and distinguished colleagues, but I'm also conscious you've had a long day and uh, you don't want a long speech from me. Um, let me start by saying that I think it's pretty widely recognised that you know, women are more vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Uh, they constitute the majority of the world's poor and they're more dependent on natural resources for their livelihoods, which of course are threatened by climate change. They're also, of course, key actors in bringing about change and they have a very strong body of practical knowledge in how to deal with the challenges of climate change. So not only is there a question of equity in making women more represented in decision making at all levels, but we lose out, we lose their expertise and their insights in these processes. So certainly it's the Australian view that getting more women involved will not only be fair and just, but also get us a much better outcome in our climate change discussions. In that vein, um, we've been quite focused on how we might do something practical to assist women, to empower women to be involved um, more actively in this very complex policy area. Um, there have been a series, I think, of um, resolutions in the UNFCCC, it's a standing item in CSW, on how to empower women in climate change negotiations. and. Uh, the Pacific Islands Forum leaders also made a declaration in 2012 to tr try and promote empowerment of women. So in a practical way, um, we're launching a workshop next month in Suva in Fiji uh, for women negotiators from our region, basically uh, try, try to assist them to engage more actively in the climate change discussions. I think there are some 14 developing country members of the Pacific Islands Forum. We've invited two participants from each country really to try to empower them to engage more actively. It's a five-day program run by the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy from our National University in Canberra, but being run in the region in terms of accessibility. Clearly the focus is threefold, one on basically um, building capacity of Pacific Island women to engage in the negotiations. Many have not had experience in international conferences, so it's a confidence building measure for them. Also, I think, to develop the negotiating communication and leadership skills to participate in that diplomacy. And, of course, thirdly, um, to, I think, sensitise people to the importance of the gender dimension of the climate change agenda and encourage networking so those colleagues in the region can connect with each other and empower each other. So it's a very practical exercise. I think it's 22, 26 June. Um, obviously, it hasn't been held yet, so we're holding our breath that it works well. We'll be keen to report back but hopefully we can feed in the uh, lessons learned to the um, initiative that's been launched today in terms of a practical effort to empower women. Um, I should just mention also briefly, I'm conscious I don't want to speak for too long, that our development assistance program is very focused on, on gender and I guess gender issues generally focus very uh, highly in our government's uh, uh, agendas. From three points of view, I think empowering women economic in the economic sense um, critical for women to have more of a role in the in the economy. Um, in the G20, um, a, a declaration was launched at the last G20 meeting in Brisbane, uh, looking at a 20% increase in women's participation in the labour force by 2020. So there was a real focus on empowering women in that context in the G20. Um, women's voice in decision making, leadership, and peace building. I've mentioned um, work on climate change. But we're very focused on what women can do in conflict resolution prevention, particularly in our own region. And thirdly, of course, violence against women. And you'll be familiar with Security Council initiatives in that area where Australia was uh, leading in our uh, non-permanent role in the last two years. So very focused on those three areas. Um, 
about, I think about two thirds, three quarters of our development assistance programs have a strong focus on gender in some shape or form. So some $2 billion of our development program has a gender dimension to it. So this issue really is front and centre. Our Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, is a real zealot on this subject, subject and uh, very keen to be innovative and look at how we can really empower women in that context. So a lot's happening in the development realm. Um, I should also mention a couple of other quick things. Um, Australia launched uh, an ambassador for women and girls a few years ago. Um, our current ambassador for women and girls is a former senator, uh, Natasha Stottespoir, a young woman who's uh, broken the glass ceiling in many ways, a very successful political career, and she's very active in our region, particularly in um, basically engaging women, in engaging um, and trying to empower women, promoting the gender agendas there. Um, incidentally, we have our former Ambassador of Women and Girls in Geneva at the moment, Penny Williams, who's a fellow at the uh, Geneva Centre for Security Policy, so she's around if you want to talk to her about her experiences. And uh, we've been encouraging other countries to launch this initiative because we found it's had a, a very powerful effect, uh, not just symbolic effect, very practical effect in empowering women uh, in many ways, so I'd encourage people to think about that. I mentioned the G20, um, wherever uh, we're engaged, we try to promote gender issues. Um, I mentioned in passing too, we have a small state's office in Geneva, uh, the Commonwealth uh, uh, sponsors that as does Australia and other donors and that, that initiative has, has helped empower a number of women delegates in Geneva to participate more actively in negotiations here. There's a human rights advisor, a trade advisor and we hope that office can actually deliver more services over time. So I might leave it at that, I just really wanted to put a few points on the table of practical action that we're taking. Um, I'm listening very hard for the conversation today. I think we can learn from each other. We're very keen to understand and listen to um, experiences and projects that have worked. Can we replicate them elsewhere? Can we modify them for particular reason, uh, regions? Uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, process, but I think this is a wonderful initiative and uh, Geneva is a place where many of these elements come together and if we can empower all the specialised agencies to really promote this agenda, I think we're going to make a lot of difference. So, uh, not only in terms of equity, but in terms of um, uh, climate change, uh, global peace and security, uh, development. There are a number of areas where engaging women will give us much better outcomes. And uh, as I say, we're, we're delighted to be here and uh, very keen to engage and contribute. Thank you indeed for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador Quinn. Thank you for. Uh, outlining and summarizing all the steps taken by your diplomatic service uh, to empower and to um, f take further the discussion on women's empowerment in multilateral negotiations. Um, I go now to Ambassador Rebong and I have a question for you. As, um, as a chair of G77 Geneva chapter, what according to you are the leadership qualities that are required for um, to be an effective negotiator in the United Nations context? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just like my colleague, Ambassador John Queen of Australia, I would like to um, thank and congratulate UNITAR, the WMO, and your partner agencies, the UN Women, uh, UNDP, and UNISDR, uh, for launching this women's leadership program, which promotes gender equality and women empowerment and strengthens the leadership through activities and trainings in diplomacy in weather and climate context. So this is a very interesting discussion. I hope the men will stay in the uh, conference room and will participate in the uh, Q&A after our presentation. I remember last year uh, when I attended the opening of the conference on the gender dimensions of weather and climate services organized by WMO. I said that the Philippines being vulnerable to um, natural disasters takes DRR seriously, that's disaster risk reduction. And this includes ensuring that women who are included in the vulnerable population do not only receive the assistance they need when natural disasters strike, but are given the important role in the design, formulation, and implementation of DRR policies and programs. This, the Philippines made sure, is reflected in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction for 2015-2030. I am glad that the recommendations put forward by that conference of WMO focus on incorporation of gender and weather and climate services in all relevant sectors of governance and into the work of UN agencies, civil society, regional, national, and local authorities. 
This evening, I was tasked to share with you my views on the question, what leadership qualities are required and expected from the UN or from the diplomats uh, in order to advance women's role and their empowerment in weather and climate context. Reflecting on what I could possibly share with you, I recall the strong-willed, passionate, hardworking, and purpose-driven women who have surrounded me, inspired me in my growing years and in my professional life. My mother, tough, determined, and hardworking, her foresight and crisis management skills were exceptional. The women of officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs in the Philippines who showed that diplomacy can also be served exceptionally well by women foreign service officers. The women leaders of the Philippines who continue to prove that equality and women empowerment is a must for a nation to move on or to move forward. The hardworking women in my community who equally support the families financially and make sure that their children are well taken care of. And lastly, our strong-willed women overseas workers who have the courage to leave their families behind to help provide better life for their children. From all these women, I can cite leadership qualities that we diplomats and UN officials should possess in order to advance women's role and their empowerment. Number one, we should be purpose-driven and opportunity-driven. We should know what we want. Women, we should know what we want. We want equality in opportunities. We want empowerment. If we know and we are sure of what, what we want, we should work for it. We want equal role in the formulation, planning, decision making, implementation of policies and programs related to weather and climate context, DRR, humanitarian assistance, agriculture, food security, public health, water resource management, and also in the financing of these activities. I repeat, we should know what we want and we should work for it. Women diplomats and UN officials should make sure that the role of women is enhanced in two fronts. First, in the participation of women delegates in important intergovernmental uh, negotiations that are going on this year, and the Ambassador Queen has mentioned it. We have the very important post-2015 development agenda process in New York, the third international conference on financing for development, which will be held in Addis Ababa in July, the climate change conference in Paris, and uh, the second objective that we have to work for is to make sure that in the drafting of final documents for these processes, the important role of women should be acknowledged and included in the final documents. For example, and I, would just, I just would like to cite uh, what the Philippines has done and is doing. In the Philippines, our delegation to the Sendai Conference was headed by two prominent leaders, our Secretary of Social Welfare and Development and a member of the Senate, who is one of the UNDRR champions, Senator Ligarda. We had 29 women members of the delegation. For the climate change, the UNFCCC, our head of delegation is a woman, the vice chairperson of our Climate Change Commission. Uh, incidentally, the chairperson is the president, so the president cannot go and attend all these meetings of UNFCCC. Uh, in our delegation, we have 13 out of 24 members of delegation in Bonn last June, and 22 women out of 36 members of the delegation for the meeting of UNFCCC in Lima last December. We have a woman delegate from Manila to this ongoing WMO Congress, and I would say 50%, because we only have two representatives from Manila, and one of them is a woman. In just uh, concluded uh, World Health Assembly, there were nine women delegates out of 12 members of the delegation. We have women delegates to ITU meetings, to international labor conferences here in Geneva, and WIPO meetings. Women leaders, when confronted with a challenge, look for the opportunity within. We should see opportunity in everything that we do. Optimism should be our mindset. Women diplomats and officials, UN officials, should be passionate and creative. 
Women leaders are passionate explorers in pursuit of excellence. They push for making things better, getting things done, and they avoid procrastination. Passion should turn us to be potent pioneers of new possibilities. And here, passion should be coupled with creativity. Currently, there exists a significant gender gap with respect to the representation of women in delegations to UN multilateral conferences. So I have said, as I have said before, we women who are here in this conference room and UN officials who are here should really push for the inclusion of women in our delegations. As leaders, we should remain passionate and creative and develop and deliver context-centered training programs to support gender-sensitive services so as to meet the needs of women in different roles and in different regions, cultures, and socioeconomic situations. In this regard, let me mention the new Women's Leadership Program. Uh, again, it's first Women's Leadership Workshop to be held on June 6, alongside the 17th World Meteorological Congress aims to strengthen the skills of female delegates and diplomats attending the WMO Congress, and we should all take advantage of that. Women should be bold and strategic. We should be bold and strategic. Women leaders know how to play the game when they have to. They know what cards to play and keenly calculate the timing of each move they make. To get to the root cause of a problem, for instance, in the area of women and careers in weather, water, and climate, in the case where women are typically underrepresented in national and international institutions that are involved in the generation of weather and climate services, we should expand women's participation in science, in technology, engineering, and mathematics, particularly in meteorology, met meteorology and hydrology, and by increasing the visibility and attractiveness of careers in these areas for women and men too. Let us call for an emphasis on the diversity of careers for women and men in these areas and to improve the salaries and conditions in many countries for, their, for these careers so that more women would go in this field. My message is very clear. If we want a strong leadership role of women in weather and climate context and in, in all aspects that the UN deals with, then we need strong and bright women to help drive it. One thing is certain, if we in the UN and as leaders in the international community would like to seriously take our commitment in strengthening the voice of women in diplomacy and enhancing their potential, then we should be opportunity driven, bold and strategic, and passionate and creative to achieve something of significance. Thank you very much, and I look forward to our discussions after this meeting, or after the presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ambassador Ribong. You have outlined a lot of practical steps that would help us and guide this discussion. Thank you very much. And now to you, Ambassador Kairamo. I know that you played a major role in chairing in Sendai, and I would like to ask you if you can please share with us, um, according to you, what role does gender play in ensuring effective reduction in disaster risk from your experience in Sendai? Thank you. And I thank you very much, moderator. Before going back to your question, I mean, uh, like my fellow colleagues, I mean, I would like to start by uh, congratulating UNITAR and its sister organization, UN Women, WMO, UNISDR, uh, UNFCCC, and UNDP for launching this, I mean, Women's Leadership Program. I mean, I'm extremely honored and proud to be part of the launch event. I mean, thank you so very much. Uh, and then second issue, I mean, that uh, uh, just, I mean, to start by saying that, I mean, the president that I worked for seven years uh, in my own country uh, is actually a woman. So, I mean, I start from there. Uh, but going back to your question, I mean, uh, gender has everything to do 
uh, with I mean disaster risk reduction, and I mean uh, allow me to highlight I mean big the background uh, for for that thinking. Disasters affect women, girls, men, and boys differently. Clearly, women and girls are disproportionately affected by disasters, for example, through increased loss of livelihoods and gender-based violence. The fact that many women in disaster-prone areas are often at home, especially in rural areas, and that they are traditionally being given the role of caretakers makes women in practice drivers of everyday resilience and climate change adaptation. Women constitute 70% of the world's poor, yet they produce most of the traditional exports, food and household energy. They have learned in real life, as they have had to, how to adapt to changing environmental conditions and how to mitigate risks. Women often have the best practical access, uh, knowledge on how to tackle climate change, but they don't necessarily have access to productive assets and decision making. Just imagine how much more they could do with better resources and education and if their rights were fully respected. Therefore, the disaster risk reduction processes need to come, uh, need to, uh, come to where the people are at risk, such as women, and efforts must also be taken to ensure women's full and effective participation in decision making. Uh, you mentioned that Ambassador Ribog and I uh, attended the Sendai Disaster Risk Reduction World Conference, and I think, I mean, uh, no outcome document can be perfect, but I mean, uh, I can mention that I, I'm sure that all the participants were proud that for the first time, the outcome document on disaster risk reduction refers to the key role of women, local authorities, indigenous people, uh, youth and children, in uh, reducing, uh, reducing disaster risk. So, I mean, uh, with that respect in mind, I think we are definitely going to the right direction with our common global cooperation on disaster risk reduction. My own country, Finland, among others, has supported several projects abroad over the years to strengthen the abilities of local meteorological authorities to communicate early warning information and increase awareness. And on what I'm particularly proud of and what I think is very important, that a gender dimension has been integrated into these projects promoted by my government. The different needs and roles of women and men, girls and boys, have to be fully understood and taken into account in the efforts to reduce, uh, reduce disaster risks. As an example, Women must be fully engaged in national multi-hazard risk assessments, plans and strategies. To promote women's leadership uh, at institution level is vital to ensure women's participation in political, economic and social processes and decision making. Obstacles related to women's ownership and inherited rights, as well as to control and management of natural resources, also hinder women's opportunities. And uh, in addition, climate change is very likely to affect uh, the productivity and the use of land and thus further increases the fragility related to land ownership. Therefore, discussions on climate change, gender equality, ownership and control rights and environmental protection must be uh, closely interlinked. The law and equal, equal and effective access to justice must be safeguarded for all. Every country should work uh, to increase women's participation. Since Bali Climate Change Conference in 2007, where the Finnish delegates were among the very few women, Finland has supported many countries to increase the number, of, uh, the number and train their women delegates. Countries have also been assisted to prepare national adaptation programs for action in a gender-sensitive manner. The initiative continues to bring more women to negotiating, uh, negotiation tables every year. Currently, over 30% of delegates are women because attitudes are changing. We would like to thank the Global Gender and Climate Alliance for their groundbreaking uh, work con uh, contributing to this progress. This is just one concrete example on how to mobilize women's leadership by providing resources for it. We fully support the recognition of our member states that the final post-2015 sustainable development agenda will include a strong and comprehensive goal on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, as well as in, uh, integrating gender perspective throughout the agenda. Finland, uh, my government works towards a universal, transformative and ambitious post-2015 agenda, which will combine poverty eradication and sustainable development.
Gender equality and women's empowerment, if implemented globally, can be the most transformative elements of the post-2015 agenda. In the prevention of disasters, as well as during, uh, as well as uh, uh, during and after disasters, education is one of the most important factors. Women and girls, the elderly and indigenous women, need to have equal access to inclusive and quality education and lifelong learning, also from a, a DRR perspective. Schools have a uh, high Schools have a high potential for resilience education and provision uh, of life-saving uh, skills to girls and boys. Women should not be uh, just educated and informed. They need to be empowered and heard. And they, along with men, need to be asked to, sh to share their knowledge and vision they have uh, to reduce disaster risks. I am afraid that a failure to consider both women's and men's concerns in the design and implementation of DRR programs would lead to overlooking the true costs of disasters and make disaster risk reduction investments less effective. Promoting gender equality, women's equal participation and leadership is thus central, uh, central to effective disaster risk reduction and resilience building. I thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much for your contribution. And um, what I keep in the back of my mind is your sentence, women have the best practical knowledge in tackling climate change but don't have the means. And I think a lot of people would love to discuss the means that will be put at the disposal of women in the future by member states of the United Nations. And now uh, we come to the heart of uh, the, the person that was with us and uh, the engine behind uh, this uh, project and supporting us all the time here in Geneva, Ms. Manain Kova, thank you very much for welcoming us in the heart of hearts, as we say in the uh, Congress that you are leading. And I, we, are, we know already that you have a lot on your plate other than this panel, so we are thankful for you. And please uh, share with us whatever information we need to know to take the discussion further. Thank you. Thank you, Al-Haddad, for your very kind words. And um, it's, um, it's, I would better refer your words to the meteorology, which is now being considered actually the heart of disaster risk reduction and climate resilience. And uh, I'd like to, to give you a story how this uh, leadership program actually came about. Uh, we, WMO, are extremely proud and appreciative to be the first agency to, 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 be, uh, to be trained and we use opportunity of the Congress where we have uh, a lot of female uh, uh, delegates who are um, interested in this training. But this all came about, uh, to my memory, about three years ago in the UNFCCC COP in Doha uh, when Christiana Figueres finally succeeded to get a resolution on 50-50 vision for the governance in the conferences of party. And I was uh, certainly participating in the high level gender day as I always did. And uh, we sat together and discussed. She said, look, we have less than a quarter female delegates, but you, you are a meteorological community. Those are females and males who really understand the science, who understand the substance. How can we get them in here, supply? <laughs> so, well, uh, I didn't want to, to upset Christiana, but the reality in WMO was not quite better. In our own governance, it's 20% uh, of female delegates who are present and we made a survey and a count of all our databases. And today I'm very happy to see many male faces, but uh, those, those women who are in the room are about all delegates who are attending the Congress. So you, you see that there are not very many. And then we also looked what are the reasons. Uh, maybe we can fix the roots of the problem. And we looked uh, to the national level, how many women are, and men are working in the National Weather Service from where we uh, actually draw our, our governance in the national level situation, a global workspace globally was not quite very different and uh, only uh, one of five senior managers uh, is woman so far and we have found that less than a quarter of the chiefs of service delivery are female. That's, uh, and that's only one third of researchers are women at the national level. So then we looked at what we have in WMO in terms of policy. Can we promote uh, this uh, at the national level so we, we can fix the problem at governance level? So uh, uh, we uh, can do much, uh, which is within our sort of authority uh, uh, in terms of training of women and uh, whatever opportunity we have to select a woman for a fellowships award, we do so. Uh, and we have uh, 
uh, policy to do it on an equitable basis. But we also realize that too few women actually apply for these fellowships. And last year, only 23% of women were applicants. Of course, they were almost all successful because uh, we won the parity. So we realize that there is much more to do. Uh, and uh, we also looked at those regions who, are, uh, who have parity or even uh, more women than men, and I don't want to give you all the figures, but uh, for instance, in the South America, uh, it enjoys more parity generally than others, and there is a non number of countries when ladies are actually majority in the workspace, and uh, uh, few few men around, they don't complain, they say that it's very good uh, to have many female uh, colleagues, but again, but this is not very representative. So. Uh, we, we asked UNESCO to, to tell us what is the, the situation in the natural sciences and the physics and mass. Those are disciplines that underpin meteorology to begin with. And they, they told us that uh, studies uh, show that the uh, situation is not very good because uh, women are underrepresented in both basic scientific research and in decision-making level and in the managerial research. So this gender, ba UNESCO is talking about gender bias when women are choosing the profession uh, for many countries and many cultures, mathematics and physics are not perceived as a female profession. So we, gave, we came down the very roots. And uh, I was uh, trying also to, to think how, how came up. I, I became such as almost exception because I really enjoyed and benefited from the good education in physics and math and meteorology. And I made my way here in this position. Uh, so I must have done something right, but then I recall that when I was uh, choosing my major in university, uh, I was interested in oceanography, but I was said that uh, no girls on the boat. So oceanography at that time in my country was not perceived as a female profession. So I, I went to meteorology and hydrology, and I never regret of this my, one day in my life. So I'm, I'm in the right place. Um, and. Um, Apparently, but now how can we help this all women and how can we uh, help them to realize their aspirations and their, their will to, to do the things? So we came up with a gender conference in November last year and all ambassadors, distinguished ambassadors speaking here on the podium, they were there at this conference. So I went, while, while they were talking, they were using so much of the language we have arrived at the conference. And I was very happy to say that we also did developed a, a big uh, community of ambassadors of gender sensitive weather and climate services. Uh, each of you pronounce the word meteorology without any hesitation. And you articulate with the, with the terminology which we before we perceived quite technical. So at this uh, conference, we looked at the, not only at the roots of our profession, but also what can we do as a community of meteorologists to, to provide gender sensitive services to those who, are, who, who need them mo most. Uh, I, this is not a, a topic of today, but just to say that each time we were talking about this, we were returning back to the, uh, to the building capacity and the skills of women, in particular for them to be in managerial and positions. So, of course, uh, the uh, critical job which female and male meteorologists do uh, now is uh, almost uh, quite broadly recognized. They protect life and property, they boost economic prosperity, provide industries with critical information, provide advice to health authorities, support sustainable management of water resources, provide farmers with critical information, and on and on and on. However, uh, uh, we, we see that uh, this extremely valuable expertise is underused, and especially in the policy and decision-making level. So here we are with the workshop. It was uh, really amazing how this partnership came up with this idea of the, of the program. Uh, the Conference on Gender Dimensions of Weather and Climate Services was in partnership with UNSDR, FAO, World Health Organization, uh, World Bank, UN Women, so all the agencies. So we per pursued interagency collaborative <laughs> way to how to address it. And we see already that less than six months, we already see and hear WHO talking about these issues in their programs and premises. Certainly UNFCCC has picked up uh, on the recommendations from our conference and already promoted them in the last uh, COP. Uh, UN Women is using this in the, uh, in, the, in the elaborations of Commission on Women and Girls. So we start really mainstreaming the, the, this 
pro problem and into the programmatic aspects of work of our partners. And it, was, it, it wasn't a long time when UNITAR came to us to say, this is a program we want to, to, to sponsor, are you with us? So that wasn't a very unnecessary question to ask, of course we are. So I really firmly believe that we have possibility to help with equal opportunity for women and men. We can do a lot ourselves in our workplace. We can be mentors who provide advice, guidance, motivates women. But also, wherever we are, male or female, we can, we can give them this opportunity to realize their potential. We, we female, we, can also, we should also be role models for them. I wanted to, to name a few, few, few women in this room, but there are more than, 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 uh, than, than I managed to put in my list. Here, there are permanent representatives of uh, several countries uh, in, with WMO, which are female. And you know, in WMO, the permanent representatives are not ambassadors, they are directors of weather service. And to be a director of weather service, Ladies, this is tough job. <laughs> this is this is very very strong to be to be such a such a permanent representative. We have few of them elected and on the ofi uh, officials and uh, officers in WMO, vice presidents of commissions and regional associations. So we have promoted them so others could see that uh, the way here is not long, but it's very hard and you need to work a lot. So I think that I, I would like to conclude by saying I really, really welcome this program coming to WMO. I know we were restricted to select only a few participants, about 20 plus ladies, but I am sure that uh, they will benefit from this and build their skills for negotiation, for advocacy, for being a part of governing uh, body, and that will serve, it will, it will be only the beginning and not the end. So we will also launch a, a call for the special fund for women fellowships. Uh, we would like members to, to help us here, but uh, many other things we planned, but this is a very, very good action soon after the conference to show the community that it was not in vain they came together, that, that we are acting upon what we heard and, and we are doing this in collaborative framework with governments and UN institutions. Thank you indeed very much. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have you with us as a partner on this program. We cherish your determination, your passion, and your tenacity to make a change. And um, it, maybe it is a beginning, it's a big program, but uh, the discussion that we are going to have is going to lead to something positive. Now we are going to continue with the other partner that we have on board, it's UNDP. So Ms. Sekhanet, it's for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for this event. We're very happy to support this, this initiative, and we're very happy that we've been asked to be part of this panel, such a number of distinguished panels, panelists. A lot have already been said, and I know that, as was mentioned, this is the end of a long day. Uh, I will try to keep my points uh, short, but also just mention a few uh, perspectives from the UNDP uh, angle. To be successful, measures to address climate change must include participation of women and reflect their experiences and voices, both because they are disproportionately impacted by climate change, as been mentioned by a number of the panelists, but also because they have valuable knowledge and practical experience to contribute. Women must be both equal participants and beneficiaries. Gender equality is, above all, in fact, a matter of human rights. And, uh, but but adv advancing gender equality is also catalytic. It was mentioned about the importance of a specific goal under the Sustainable Development Goals under development on gender equality, but evidence shows that gender equality and women's empowerment have multiplier benefits for women, their families and communities. So reducing gender gaps has been critical to achieving the MDGs as a whole and will be equally essential to the post-2015 development agenda and the implementation of the new Sustainable Development Goals, which we uh, look forward to being adopted later this year. Since 2007, UNDP joined forces with other UN and civil society organizations to form the Global Gender and Climate Alliance, or the GGCA. This alliance now includes more than 100 organizations working to ensure that climate change decision-making policies and programs recognize and reflect the real needs, priorities, and capacities of women and men. The GGCA has supported women participants in international climate change negotiations and advocated for government delegates and practitioners to take the gender dimensions of climate change into account into their work. 
With the agreement of the COP18 to promote gender balance and improve the participation of women in climate negotiations, we've succeeded in shifting the paradigm in climate policy making by making gender a salient issue. The challenge now, though, is to make sure gender equality and women's empowerment are fully implemented and remain a guiding principle. During the last COP20 in Lima, important decisions were taken in advancing gender mainstreaming in the climate change process by approving the Lima work program on gender that will support training and awareness raising for female and male delegates as on issues related to gender balance and climate change and building the skills and capacity of the female delegates to effectively participate in the UNFCCC meetings uh, via training on inter alia negotiation skills, drafting of legal language and strategic communication. We must therefore support national governments to ensure that women have the capacity to meaningfully participate in discussions on climate change, to address the structural barriers to women's participation in the first place, to establish accountability framework for measuring and achieving gender balance, and to allocate the needed resources, including enhancing of capacities and expertise on gender and climate change. We must also continue to advocate for access to climate funds for women's initiatives at the national level in global governance and policy instruments. Funding for climate change mitigation and adaption needs to be accessible and of equal benefit to women, especially the poorest. This effort from UNITAR and other UN agencies is also relevant as it will contribute positively to women's leadership and ensure gender balance within global governance processes, particularly in weather and climate change contexts. But UNDP also look forward to working with UNITAR on advancing women's leadership and gender balance within governance provinces also in other and all contexts. Finally, of these kinds of efforts could not only help provide the transformational response to climate change the world so direly needs, but could also reduce inequalities between women and men. Together, they could bring us that much closer to building an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable world. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sekenes. And uh, one thing I should mention is that our two last executive directors and the current executive director, they were former senior UNDP staff members. So we cherish our partnership and we look forward to enhancing it. Thank you very much. And now I think we have three movies. The first one by Ms. Lakshmi Puri. We can go to the first one and then move uh, afterwards to Ms. Wallstrom and then Ms. Amina Mohammed. Thank you. It's the second time we will see Amina Mohammed on the screen, but the first time this afternoon she was live. <laughs>
try to make Last year, in 2014, during the UN Secretary General's Climate Summit in New York, UN Women in by distinguished guests, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today on the occasion of the launch of the UN Interagency Women's Leadership Program. Women in Diplomacy, the leading role of women in weather and climate contexts. I want to extend my thanks to UNITA, the World Meteorological Organization, the UNFCCC Secretariat, and other partners for their leadership in the development of this important program, which is designed to strengthen women's leadership both within governments and the UN system. UN Women is privileged to be a partner of this program and is committed to supporting the concrete steps to contribute to strengthening the engagement of women and their full and equal participation in all climate change contexts, including in negotiating outcomes, implementing actions, monitoring, and holding governments accountable to their commitments. The launch of this program comes at a most opportune time, I would say historic time, as we approach the finalization of the Sustainable Development Goals and a 2015 Climate Change Agreement, we are looking forward to new commitments for people and planet, a world that works for all women and men. Earlier this year, in the context of the 20-year review of the Beijing Platform for Action, member states committed at the Commission on the Status of Women to work towards the full, effective, and accelerated implementation of the Platform for Action across all of its 12 critical areas of concern including women in power and decision-making. The platform serves as the blueprint for transformative approaches to achieve gender equality and the empowerment of women in the post-2015 development agenda and related processes. For UN Women, women's leadership and agency in decision-making on climate change action has been a key priority since its creation. We have been also active in supporting and highlighting the role of women as agents of change in the responses to climate change, the environment, and disasters at all levels. In 2012, UN Women organized the Women Leaders Summit at the Rio Plus 20 conference, which brought together women heads of government and state who pledged their support and urged government, civil society, and the private sector to prioritize gender equality and women's empowerment in the sustainable development agenda and accelerate actions for its implementation. The following year, UN Women contributed to the debate on how to implement the decision taken by the parties to the UNFCCC at COP18 on improving women's participation in the UNFCCC negotiations by preparing a study with the Mary Robinson Foundation on strategies to improve women's participation in achieving gender balance. Last year, 
In 2014, during the UN Secretary General's Climate Summit in New York, UN Women, in collaboration again with the Mary Robinson Foundation, convened a meeting of women leaders from around the globe who raised the ambition for climate action. Our advocacy has resulted in positioning gender equality issues as part of the official agenda of the COPs. Just last year, at COP20, parties adopted the two-year Lima work program on gender with action-oriented mandates spanning the elaboration of gender equality linkages across the thematic areas discussed in the UNFCCC context. So why is this new program relevant? Women have repeatedly proven to be effective agents of change, as reflected in their knowledge of sustainable natural resources management, in their leadership at the household, community, national, and global levels, to respond to and find common solutions to climate and weather-related crises. Yet women remain significantly underrepresented in decision-making at all levels, and in all spheres, from households to local governments, planning and development structures, service delivery organizations, national parliaments, executive governments, and global governance institutions too. Women continue to face barriers in the form of institutional and structural constraints, be it in terms of access to resources, absence of property and inheritance rights, lack of access to knowledge and information, or to training and skills development or capacity building. And sociocultural stereotypes continue to perpetuate the idea that women should not have a role in public life. This is why this interagency women's leadership program led by UNITAR is so very important. Women as agents of change in their own right will benefit from and enhance technical expertise in fields like climate and weather services, where women are still the minority in decision-making processes. The inclusion of women in decision-making is a matter of human rights, justice, and equality, but it also would contribute enormously to the effectiveness of whatever we do. International human rights norms are very clear about how the right to participation, the principles of equality and non-discrimination should play out in addition, the active presence of women has also been shown to improve institutions because it ensures gender-specific concerns are included on the agenda and encourages the monitoring of the implementation of related policies and programs. Examples from across the world show that where the increased participation of women in decision-making led to legislation targeting the gaps in access to health and education, increasing access to finance, land, and inheritance rights, and unpaid care work, to name just a few of the issues that undermine women's rights and prevent their full engagement as citizens. Other examples from India and Nepal have demonstrated the increasing effectiveness of policies on forest management, where women's leadership was incorporated. Once the inclusion of women had reached critical mass, there was a fall in logging and illegal forest activities. The launch of the Women's Leadership Program will go a significant way towards building capacity to work towards institutional transformation, to ensuring a much needed mainstreaming of gender perspectives into national policies, action plans, and other measures on climate and weather based on systematic gender analysis. The program also provides an opportunity for the participants to mentor others and to build alliances, and mentorship is really important, and to build alliances amongst different stakeholders, governments, UN system, civil society, women and men, and citizens who can work together for the achievement of gender equality. On behalf of UN Women, I once again congratulate UNITA for its leadership in launching this program. UN Women will be actively supporting your implementation, you can count on it. I thank you. Thank you, and we still have- Excellency and colleagues. I wish Excellency and colleagues. I wish to thank UNITAR for launching this new women's leadership program and for organizing this particular
Excellency and colleagues, I wish to thank UNITAR for launching this new women's leadership program and for organizing this particular session on the leading role of women in the context of weather and climate change discussions, which is also linked directly to a stronger role of women in disaster risk reduction. In March this year in Sendai, Japan, at the third United Nations World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, world leaders and representatives of 187 member states reaffirmed their commitment to disaster risk reduction and called for a greater role for all stakeholders, including women. In particular, delegates emphasized the need to depart from traditional views of incapability and stereotyping of women as vulnerable groups. Weather-related events today cause more than 80% of all disasters worldwide. Disasters affect women, girls, boys and men differently. Inequality itself is a risk factor undermining disaster risk reduction. Many countries of course involve men women and men actively in disaster risk management and planning and have integrated gender dimensions into risk reduction and disaster response plans. Effective climate and weather services should ensure that women have better and equal access to critical information on hazards, risks, vulnerabilities and preparedness measures. Empowered women strengthen their leadership through decision making in managing and reducing disaster risk and in preparing for managing and recovering from disasters. This is principal to the successful and effective risk reduction action. I am sure you will all agree that the stronger engagement of women is necessary in the work towards building a safer and more resilient future for all. Without women leading and engaging, such a future is not possible. Thank you for your attention. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to celebrate with you today, if only via video. I would like to congratulate the launch of the Women's Leadership Program, which will be an essential vehicle for enhancing collaboration and delivering actions to strengthen the voice of women in diplomacy. Women's leadership is key to delivering on the post-2015 agenda, including tackling climate change. To achieve the new development agenda in an accelerated, sustainable and gender sensitive way, women must be at the front lines in decision making and implementation at all levels. Women are the nexus to food, water and energy and hold the keys to economic growth. Therefore, we must eliminate all barriers to full women's in inclusion and enhance pathways to empowerment as gender discrimination we all know undermines the potential of nations to develop. Climate risks and vulnerabilities exacerbate existing patterns of inequality and gaps in development, placing an even greater burden on women. It is thus critical to align national and local policies with the Sustainable Development Goals to eradicate poverty and reduce inequity through inclusive climate action. Gender-sensitive policies are of particular importance to protect the rights and welfare of women and unlock their full potential. Women all over the world are feeling the intense impacts of climate change, and they are taking action and adapting to save their livelihoods and families. Rural and indigenous women in particular possess valuable knowledge and skills in meteorology and forecasting. Using their expertise of weather patterns, they are adjusting their agricultural practices and other activities, really demonstrating creativity and strong determination. Given their experiences in building climate resilient communities, women are proven agents of change and the most convincing advocates for women's needs. Therefore, with the right tools and opportunities, they can be the most powerful drivers of sustainable development. More women are needed in the fields of science, technology, engineering and mathematics to serve key roles in disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation and mitigation. Moreover, women's leadership in the private sector is essential if we want to move away from the business as usual and transition to a zero carbon economy. Furthermore, women at the grassroots level must be empowered through enhanced access to information, 
relevant technology and financial services as they will be the leaders in implementing the post-2015 agenda and monitoring its progress. Ladies and gentlemen, the year 2015 is truly a time for global action. Women's engagement at the three high-level meetings in Addis Ababa, New York and Paris are critical to achieve a shared vision on the path to sustainable development. Considering all that they have and continue to face every day, women are experts in resilience. Therefore, they must lead the way. I thank you very much for your attention and wish you a really successful panel discussion on a really important topic. I would like to thank our three colleagues, United Nations colleagues, for their contributions. And now we come to the questions answers part of the panel. When you take the floor, please introduce yourself. And if your question is targeting one of the panelists, please indicate the name of that person. So let us take first five questions, and then we answer them after we take them all. Thank you. Thank you, moderator, and well done to UNITA and the other UN agencies for this fabulous program being launched this evening. And thank you, of course, to WMO for hosting a, a wonderful panel with three extraordinary ambassadors. My name is Jane Hodges, and I was for over 30 years working in the International Labour Organization, now with UNRIST. I'm fascinated to hear local uh, descriptions of how to get empowerment of women into the multilateral diplomacy world. Yet at the same time, I wonder whether the General Assembly resolution is saying that all UN meetings should have at least 30% women on their delegations is actually seriously uh, taken into account. I'd like to ask the three ambassadors, uh, put you on the spot as it were, uh, what about giving resolutions of this type some real teeth? by saying, if delegations come to major international or multilateral meetings without parity, or at least one-third women delegates, they can come, but they cannot speak. And could I also ask, perhaps our UN colleagues, uh, would you uh, support measures whereby we make public, uh, as our WMO speaker uh, bravely did, some very strict and stark data about which delegations do, in fact, include women, particularly which delegations include women as their main delegation leader, how many women actually speak rather than coming and being registered and sitting at the back writing the speeches for the male delegation leader. And if we could plot that so that uh, perhaps the Ban Ki-moon or the next woman, Secretary General of the United Nations, would write to uh, delegations saying, why did you not have parity between the sexes? Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have other questions? We have United States. Yes. Thank you for your presentations today and uh, the time in this late hour on this important topic and allowing us to have discussion on this topic. Um, several of you actually talked about women having the best tactical knowledge of facing the issues that are presented to the weather community and the globe in general on climate change, but lacking the resources. And at the gender conference, we saw that um, many various entities were developing applications for the smartphones, but overall, on a global level, more men had smartphones than women by a significant amount. So again, when you talk about advancing gender quality, equality and supporting women in regards to the resources, how would, you, how would you actually do that? How do we get more cell phones and resources in the hands of women to actually then um, be a part of the decision-making process. When we look at this, I think one point in particular we want to keep in mind is we may come off a bit uh, brash at times when we just talk about 
um, gender equality, and we've been trying to take the term gender mainstreaming. So in general, in regards to building a weather-ready nation, we look at all genders and the impacts of various weather, because weather such as lightning and rip currents affect men differently than women. So there are differences, and incorporating that into our forecast and warning processes is important. But I think the topic here today really is um, how to get the resources in the hands of women so they can be a more, more part of the process. So your uh, comments on that would be welcomed. Thank you again. Good evening. Uh, it's Rob Varley, permanent representative for the UK. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, just ad address, if I may, the men in the room, um, which looking around are remarkably fewer than there were an hour ago. Um, and just share with you my uh, changing perception of the gender issue. Uh, for, I hope, all of my career, I have um, been somebody who believes in gender equality, equal rights, the um, the, the absolute right of everybody uh, from whatever uh, diverse background to have an equal opportunity to progress their career and to lead. Um, but it's only in recent years that I've really appreciated what true diversity is all about, which is not just about giving everybody an equal opportunity, but it's also about recognizing that diversity amongst our, all of our people, particularly amongst our leaders, is in itself enriching. And I would like to thank all of the speakers this evening for, in different ways, uh, making that point very clearly, that it's not simply a matter of being fair to everybody, giving them an opportunity to progress, but recognizing that by doing so, we enrich the whole. And therefore, for those of us who are leaders, male leaders of Met Service, like myself to recognize that it is absolutely in our own interests to promote uh, the opportunities for women and indeed for all uh, um, different groups uh, to enrich our leadership teams. Um, with that in mind, I'd like to uh, share uh, the challenge that I have in the UK, which is that in, in recent years, our education system has increasingly equalized the, uh, uh, the, the, the the talent that we have coming into the organization. We have nearly equal male and female within our scientific uh, intake, uh, but still uh, much fewer uh, uh, evidence of women progressing to more senior levels within the organization. Um, so when I look at, at the, if you like, the talent that's available for me to recruit from to top positions in the organization, there are still many more men than women pushing upwards. Um, and I would appreciate any advice you can give to me and others who are in the same position, I'm sure there are many. How can we encourage more young women in junior positions in our organizations to see senior leadership as an attractive uh, opportunity for them that they would aspire to? Because as I've just said, I'm sure that by doing so, we will enrich all of our organizations and help them to be better fitted to meet the huge challenges of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. We still have two questions to take. Iceland has a... They need to request the microphone. We have, yeah, you... we have ASECNA. Uh, those who are sitting under ASECNA, this uh, request is on a long time. Let, let us try. Okay. So perhaps it was just a microphone left on, and we don't have any other requests. No, I don't think. Ah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Ana Maria Meshkurti. I am coming from the ITU. Uh, I had uh, two main questions. The first one was if you could share with us maybe some of the challenges that you have encountered as women while trying to uh, uh, go towards the top uh, of the leadership. And my second question is what can we as a general public uh, do for this issue and uh, to promote gender equality? Uh, when I leave this room, what can I concretely do to help uh, not only this program but also to promote gender equality uh, further? Thank you. I think this is it. Now we can start taking the questions, starting with the first one from our colleague from ILO uh, about the local description of how to empower women and the GA resolution that you mentioned and the 30% um, that should be 
on every delegation that is going to and come and negotiate in a multilateral setting. So your question was about the teeth that could help enforce this resolution, and it was targeting our ambassadors. So I will start with you, Ambassador Quinn, if you have anything to say, and then we move to the left side. Thank you. Thanks. Um, interesting question. Um, this issue of quotas and uh, basically measures positive discrimination, there's a lot of lively debate about this, and I guess I hear you. I mean, a personal reaction, I think the target is something that governments take seriously, but I'd have to say I'm a bit concerned about a mechanical application of quotas. I mean, I think part of the challenge is enabling uh, colleagues to participate fully in these negotiations, but I, th I think the second part of your question I I'm more attracted to, that publishing the data, I think, is is useful. I mean, in a sense, naming and shaming. I, I don't think you'll... I mean, General Assembly resolutions are advisory. They're not binding. They're not like Security Council. And I think you might get a reaction if, if you take that too far in terms of a sort of quota-based approach. That's a personal view, not a government view. But certainly, we, we, as a government, we take that, that target seriously. But I think what, you know, what's behind the target is the key question. How do you empower people to participate uh, in these negotiations? That's really the key, key point. And I, I'd really pick up on your second issue of data. Uh, you really need to look at the facts and figures. That tells you things. That speaks volumes. So I, I very much support the second element um, in terms of uh, indicating what's going on, what, what the current state of play is, rather than a sort of campaign, a witch hunt, so to speak, in terms of numbers and, and quotas. But I think, you know, in the area of climate change, um, there are embedded issues, and I think our UK, distinguished UK colleague, put his finger on it, that, you know, we have to focus on this in terms of common sense. It's a bit like empowering women in an economic sense. Our economies suffer hugely by not having women engaged in the economy. Um, our climate change responses suffer hugely by disempowering women. So I think that's really a very powerful point to make. I mean, the human rights equity argument is powerful too, but I think what's missing from the debate is that we're missing a critical element of input into the conversation. So, uh, you know, I, I hear you, but I think I'd, I'd go for your, your data, your exposure of what's going on as, as a powerful way forward. But that's just a personal observation, but I'll, I'll pass to uh, Cecilia and other colleagues. Thank you. Um, well, there have been resolutions in the past with the General Assembly. Um, for example, there was a resolution uh, hoping that uh, in the UN itself, uh, there would be a percentage to be rich for women officials, no? But um, for delegations, um, well, my wish is for all delegations to consider seriously that women are part. But it is not just the number. If they become members of the delegation, they should participate effectively and they should be um, allowed to negotiate, make a statement, and not just be sent to New York, to Geneva, or somewhere just to meet the percentage. I think that is not the objective of what we do here and what women leaders have been pushing. Uh, we can continue, or, or the UN can publish uh, a document, just like I think IPU every year publishes a, a map uh, of women in executive positions without the names of the countries, but they do uh, come up with a, you know, annually, um, just to keep track of how many women legislators are attending IPU, how many women legislators are elected. But in the UN, maybe they can have a document where delegations, how many members of each delegation include women, but as just a reference. Not, it will not be used to name or, you know, shame uh, a country because that is not um, how we do things. We encourage, and all of this, is a part of a big thing. Um, putting women as members of the delegation means they, that their capabilities and contribution are being acknowledged. They're not being put in the delegation just to be good in, you know, in, in number. So we should continue to um, speak or uh, asking delegations to have more women in their delegations. Um, and um, I think it should also start with encouraging countries to have more women in decision-making positions in the capitals. Because if they do not have qualified women, then they wouldn't have enough women uh, delegates in their delegations. So uh, this is a whole process, and this is a, you know, a complete approach. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. We are running uh, behind time, so. Uh, Let me make a proposal. I'm trying to find out uh, do we have a limitation with interpretation or not, but before I get an answer, uh, is there anyone here who is following in other languages? How about we do a little more, more in English only? Objections? Francais? Okay. Uh, interpreters, can you please kindly help me until what time you are here? You are supposed to work this evening. Okay, tell me in the English channel, please. We were due to finish at 6.30, unfortunately. <laughs> So I'm very sorry. I was supposed uh, to, to, to run until 7. I, uh, they are already overworking 45 minutes. So thank you really, really very much. You, you could have told me. I would, I would manage differently. Et nos excuses, mesdames. Je vais vous donner après un, un petit sommaire de, de qu ce qui s'est passé, mais peut-être qu'on peut continuer juste un petit peu en anglais seulement. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Elena. So what we are going to do is to summarize the questions and... Um, they are going to be so from the distinguished delegate of the United States and the UK. Thank you very much for both of your <coughs> contributions. So basically, I invite once again our panelists to share with us their feedback on the question of resources. So according to you, how we can uh, overcome this challenge in one step, if you, if you can answer this question. And then the second question by our colleagues from the UK, how to encourage young women in organizations to see senior leadership positions as an opportunity to aspire to. So also one of your recommendations, if you can uh, help us when it comes to this. And the last from our colleague from ITU, she asked us, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, what are the challenges uh, that you faced as women when you were making it to the top? So if you can share with us one or two main challenges. And also when you leave the room, what do you take with you as delegates, I mean, what do you expect the people to take with you so that they have their own fight uh, to make sure that this program succeeds? So let us uh, start with you, Excellency, and then we go back to each one of the panelists, and then we close the whole session. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, also in the interest of time, I mean, uh, in my own head, I, I already grouped, I mean, the questions uh, presented by, by, I mean, participants. And for me, there is one particular answer. It doesn't, I mean, uh, change whether we talk about women in the beginning of their careers, women part of delegations, women leaders of delegations, women uh, getting access to technological advancements to help, I mean, uh, help change. Or, I mean, uh, the UK question, how to get women, uh, lead, more women to leadership positions, or ITU question, what do you do, I mean, when you go out? The simple answer is education. From whatever, I mean, issue, I mean, you reflect, I mean, you start early when uh, women are girls, I mean, you ensure that they get proper education, they can empower themselves, they can participate, they can learn, they can study. Uh, uh, and even in the most, I mean, senior posts, I mean, uh, I think, I mean, we need to be educated. So for us as well, uh, the fact that we, we take care of our own, I mean, lifelong learning, that we, we I mean, uh, train ourselves constantly, it's never an ending, ending story. So for me, that's the simple answer to all questions. Uh, quickly referring back to, to my own government's uh, attempts to try to promote the training and inclusion of women delegates to international ne negotiations, I already referred to the fact that Finland is supporting and funding a program to train and uh, get more, I mean, uh, delegates to climate negotiations from developing countries and in particular women, of course, uh, uh, under this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Sekenes, do you have anything to add to this? Thank you. <clears throat> Just to say that fr from uh, UNP's perspective, the data that was requested I mean, it's, it's often available in the participant lists in terms of just the sheer participation in meetings, although I agree that that is not the, the point, main point. It's obviously the active participation as well. Um, but just to say also that um, there's, I, I have not from the climate change perspective, but from the disarmament perspective, and it's not exhaustive data. I have a couple of more observations that I can do on the basis of, of um, the data we have put together on sponsorship programs over the last, let's say, six, seven years. 
And an, an additional component here, or a couple of additional components to think about, is that when there's fewer resources, and that connects to the resource issues, that affects uh, low-income states um, disproportionately. And if sponsorship programs are applied, there's fewer slots available for these delegations. And I've seen from the statistics we have that they are then more, because the pool, are, pool of men are bigger, they're more inclined to send men to the few slots. So there, there's an issue there. Um, but it's also an issue of um, connecting to the fact that women are uh, often initiators and, and more frequently come as a composition of delegations when there's new issues. But when those issues fall off the radar screen and it becomes business as usual, we see that the statistics actually divert back to old figures. So even if you have higher proportions of women participating early on in processes that are new, um, often then initiated by women, they fall off uh, after a few years and it becomes business as usual and the, and the proportion increases in male participation as well. We would never, um, from our side, post this information out there, but we do uh, see it because we literally have it in our, our databases for the sheer participation of either participant list and, and, and um, overlaps with the sponsorship program. So th there's a number of interesting things that can be read into the statistics and data of participating delegations, although it does not address the issue that, that is at the core of heart, where do actually women actively participate in the discussion. But it still hints on the fact that there's more underlying structural problems here than, than uh, what meets the, the eye um, initially. So just a few comments from our organizational uh, experience on, on uh, participation in delegations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ambassador Quinn, I come back to you. If you have any uh, additional feedback, please. Just very briefly, I'd certainly agree with Ambassador Caramo that education is really critical, but I guess the flip side is attitudinal change for, the, for males particularly. You know, in Australia, we've had quite an active program of male champions of gender equity, and that's really been quite powerful. We had quite a high-profile experience last year. Our chief of army became a, uh, a male chief of army, became a champion of gender equality, and uh, that people sat back in their chairs, and I think we need to really focus on this question of our mindsets. And again, I think our, our British uh, colleague mentioned, mentioned the diversity, the value of diversity in these conversations is critical. So I think not only do we empower women who will look after themselves, but we also have to talk to the rest of the community to get their minds around the need for uh, the value of diversity and the role that women can play in environmental and climate change areas. One other just quick observation in terms of ICT. Coming back to the UN after a, a gap of some years, I'm very struck at managing ICT is really important for all delegates and uh, I think there's a real um, applications are out there, but managing documents and information is really a huge challenge now and I think d d d diplomatic training needs to pay more attention to that and women can be disempowered but also empowered very quickly and we've seen the pick up of uh, mobile phone, phone telephony in the developing world, phenomenal take up of, of that which really has transformed many countries' access to finance. So. There are lessons to be learned from that experience in the climate change environment. Are we empowering women through that technology? In terms of women themselves, I mean, women can comment better, but I really think male champions are important, but also mentoring, support networks. You know, it's tough out there if you're a woman succeeding, and I think uh, whatever we can do to look at all the structural challenges, childcare, 101 challenges are out there for career progression. If we're sensitive to that and look at that in a, in a holistic way, I think as, uh, as Cecilia has flagged in, in many ways, there's, a, there's a, a lot of issues embedded in this. Um, that'll make a big difference. It's, it's, it's not, there's not one solution, one silver bullet that will solve this problem. It's a, it's a complex subject and we need, need to really work at it, all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency Ambassador Ribong. If you can share with us your Asian yes, wisdom on uh, this. Thank okay, you. thank you. I share and I agree with the comments of my colleagues here. And I think I would say we need more <coughs> of our UK colleagues. Somebody who really appreciates the role of uh, women in the society. But this is really a whole society approach. As Ambassador um, Queen has said, nobody can, um, you know, uh, come out with a magic wand and everything is sold. Now, there are so many things, uh, but I would say women who are here and men who believe that uh, women should be given uh, equal opportunities, we should all work together. First, we should have a supportive society. Uh, 
parents have uh, an important role. We should do away with the stereotyping of professions and careers. In many developing countries, parents still say that women should be teachers, uh, their boys should be doctors and engineers, uh, their girls should, you know, study uh, something on fashion and, and, and cooking. Uh, so much stereotyping, so much so that girls grow up in developing countries or in other countries where they think that they are not as capable as men. So we have to change this mindset. From the very start, women should be told that they have equal um, um, capabilities and should be given uh, equal opportunities. There are still some practices in many developing countries that are discriminatory to, uh, to women. So it is the responsibility of a small or a bigger group of women from those countries to push things forward. Because if, there, uh, if nobody would leave, then all those uh, discriminatory practices would stay. Um, I would say, uh, women should be helped uh, by authorities. Now, for example, myself, when I was starting in the foreign ministry, we have unwritten discriminatory practices. And if not for our some of the women ambassadors who came before me, then I wouldn't be here. Uh, before, you know, it's so difficult for um, women to be posted in big, in, you know, in, in big, in, in big posts. They are uh, only for women officers. It is difficult for men and women who are husband and wife in the foreign ministry to be posted in one post. So they are, women are the first one who resign from the foreign service. I mean, you know, it's in the society. They give way to the men. Uh, very few men would give up their career in the foreign service because their wives would want to uh, pursue a, a career in diplomacy. So uh, the authorities have responsibilities to make it easier for women to go forward. Um, and uh, the society itself, when I got married, my husband's family said, why are you allowing your wife to work? I mean, you know, in, in, in my area or where I grew up, women don't work. They are supported by their husbands. Well, I wish my husband would support me, but that's not the point. Uh, so uh, when I told them that I am uh, working, they're just like, why? So we have to talk. We have to discuss this in the families, in the society, in universities, uh, all around us. Um, women diplomats, if you are talking of diplomats, have especially married, you know, I am married, I, I raise my kids, and I tell you it's not easy. But I always tell our women diplomats in my foreign ministry, you can do it, but it, it is not easy, but if you are interested, everybody can do it. You know, I remember when I was assigned, I'm sorry, this is taking long, but just to tell you how it is. When I was assigned in Washington, D.C., and my family was living in New York, I would leave New York at 12 o'clock midnight to travel to Washington, D.C. by bus so that I am in the office by 8 or 8.30 in the morning. I was never late. On Friday evening, I would take any form of transportation to go back to New York so that when my kids woke up or when my kids wake up, I am there preparing breakfast for them. I mean, it's a lot of sacrifice, but then I had a very supportive husband, um, and uh, friends who uh, encourage me to, to, you know, to go on. Uh, and when I decided, when I was deciding to leave the foreign service, because I don't know if separating, separation from my family is good for my kids, I have colleagues in the foreign ministry who encouraged me to stay. Because, you know, women diplomats have I think a different set of, of, of challenges as uh, those in uh, male in the foreign service. But if you are determined, this is why I said we have to be passionate. We want, uh, we should be sure of what we want. If we want to um, have more women 
in the society making decisions, then we should consider ourselves as one of those women who should work hard to be there. Otherwise, we cannot expect other women to do it if we ourselves are not willing to do the sacrifices. So, uh, as I said, it's a whole society approach, but we should continue working on it. We should continue supporting programs like this. UN agencies should uh, have more of um, uh, t training programs mm -hmm. to encourage uh, uh, women to move forward, leaders. Uh, we should elect more women leaders in the government who would uh, push this kind of loss in, in, in the country. I mean, this is everybody's role. Uh, women in the streets, women in government, in the private sector, it is everybody's business. And this, is, this holds true for men. We need men to support the principle of equality and giving more opportunities to women. We cannot do it alone. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Ribong. Listening to you is so captivating and it creates a dependency. I felt the need to listen to you and I'm willing to do it until tomorrow morning because you are sharing something genuine, some an experience from your inner self. So thank you very much. Before giving the floor to Elena for the concluding remarks, I would like to thank you all, first of all, for remaining with us and, you know, being present and interacting. Thank you for our distinguished Don't panelists. Don't conclude instead of me. I'm not going no, to no, conclude. No. You will conclude. <laughs> okay, then I'll give you the floor. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, I also want to give some answers, but much shorter. Uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Ribon raised a very important uh, question about the family. In one of the high-level events in COPS, I was amongst very, very, very prominent ladies, and the room was full, it was gender day. And there were many questions, and one girl, she was a student, she said, far away like there, she was dark, and she asked, lady, how to be like you? And no one in the panel picked up this question, and I did, and I said, look, don't think it's a miracle, don't think we are special, we are normal women, we have normal family, we raise normal kids, but that just happened that we work twice more than anyone else, and the, actually, psychological studies show that women in the workplace generally are much more competitive because they always need to work harder than men to prove that they can be good. Competitiveness. Going back to meteorology, we need to make it sexy profession, I'm sorry. We need to promote meteorology as attractive profession for females. To my experience, it's very exciting profession. It may not be sufficiently gainful, but in, this is the case for many other professions in the countries, but it's a certainly a very exciting job as a as, as, as place to be. And also, uh, we, also, we only need a little bit of flexibility for, from you supervisors, males, sometimes when we need to go and pick up kids in the, in the, in the kindergarten or in the school, they wait their last, you know, it's 8 o'clock in the evening, mommy didn't come, they're alone, you know, everyone's gone, it's dark, and mommy's still at workspace. So, a little bit of flexibility, not even the money, but ex feeling of excitement, feeling of appreciation, feeling that you're doing a great job. When you want women to, to become this comfortable, I, I heard a story from an astronaut female, astronaut and a minister, I won't tell you names, and they told me, Elena, when we first come to this meeting of yours, we didn't know how to speak because we were only two ladies in the group of 15 men, we hesitated. So if you want women to speak, give, uh, give, make them a little bigger part of the team, so they would feel like they're not alone. Just little single tips. There is several interesting uh, answers which on this question, uh, uh, permanent representative of UK, which uh, we have in the gender, uh, gender conference recommendations, will not repeat and just also reflect on the USPR intervention. We do not have women in the world, 800 million women in the world do not have mobile phone at all, according to ITU. What it means for us, we are pushing a lot of war warnings and alerts right now by, sm by phones, let alone smartphones, it's even you know, luxury, but just by phones, and they don't have them. So do we think of this? I thank you very much for your patience. I would like to recognize our organizers. I would like to thank uh, Emily Fraser. Thank you very much. Uh, are, she is leading to the, to the wall. And also Asia Alexeva here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
And thank you, Ambassador, for your engagement. It was really, really good to have you here, and it was more than just uh, recognizing and respecting the event. You were very, very engaged. Thank you. Now, conclusions. <laughs> thank you, Helena. I had prepared a summary, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Ambassador Karamo. Thank you, Ambassador Ribong, Ambassador Quinn. Thank you for our colleagues from UNDP and WMO for supporting us, and they are not alone. So we have UN Women, we have ISDR, we have UNFCCC and other agencies. So we thank them all for their support. And I'm going to give you an example that proves you right. Women do have to work double to make it happen in every organization. You know, Einstein said E equals MC squared. Yes. But at UNITAR, MC squared, MC equals E squared. So I wanted, <laughs> again, to thank Emily Fraser and Emily Bradley. They are the two colleagues who took the lead on this program and make it, made it happen. I'm just the tip of the iceberg moderating the session, but they should have been in my shoes right thank now. You. So thank you both. Stand up, stand up. Go show, show yourself. Thank show, thank you. Thank you. So, I think we deserve a drink? We do. Uh, if there is any left, let's, let's hurry up. Thank you. Thank you. See you in the reception.